Hi, I'm Warren McHugh. I'm one of the paediatric registrars and currently a simulation and education fellow. Hi, I'm Gail and I am an advanced practitioner neonatal physio and we work in the regional uh, neonatal unit in Belfast. Today's video is going to look at lumbar punctures. In particular, we're going to look at two different forms of lumbar puncture. The more classical side lying position using a wrap and a slightly newer technique involving a baby sitting up. And Gail is going to be the expert talking us through both of those holds. Thanks, Warren. A lumbar puncture is most commonly performed in the neonatal period for the diagnosis or exclusion of meningitis or encephalitis, often as part of a full septic screen. There are a number of other reasons why we would occasionally perform one, particularly in older paediatric age groups, such as the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage, the diagnosis of certain neurological or metabolic conditions, or the measurement of CSF opening pressure in the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Even when meningitis is suspected, there are a number of situations when an LP should be deferred, and these include hemodynamic instability or shock, respiratory compromise, the suspicion of raised intracranial pressure, recent seizures, or focal neurological signs without prior neuroimaging. Babies with bleeding risk and those with an infected lumbar site should also have LPs avoided. Consent for lumbar punctures is taken verbally but then documented in the written notes. Both benefits and risks should be discussed with the parents. The benefits of course include the diagnosis, antibiotic sensitivities and decisions about duration and the prognostication depending on organisms. There are certain risks we must mention and these include the risk of introducing an infection, which is why it is a sterile procedure, the risk of bleeding and bruising, pain or headache, and the potential for procedural failure. To perform a lumbar puncture, there are certain pieces of equipment we require. To create a sterile field, we need a procedural trolley, a dressing pack, sterile gloves, and a sterile gown. For the procedure itself, we require analgesia, such as sucrose, an appropriate cleaning solution, dependent on the baby's gestation, and a selection of spinal needles, again dependent on gestation and size. We tend to have available in our neonatal unit the 22 gauge 1.5 inch black needle or the 25 gauge 1 inch blue needle. Both of these are quinky, cutting type needles and therefore the orientation of the bevel is important on insertion, but we will discuss this later in the video. We will need a number of sterile sample pots depending on what condition we are looking for. We require four for meningitis. We will additionally need a dressing for the baby's back at the end of the procedure. Don't forget to measure a pre-procedure capillary blood glucose for comparison against the CSF glucose sample. Here you can see all of the equipment laid out on top of our procedural trolley, still in its packaging. We have a pair of sterile gloves and a sterile gown with sleeves. In the neonatal ICU, a lumbar puncture is considered a sterile procedure and therefore an apron is not sufficient. A sterile dressing pack which contains our gauze and a sterile field and a selection of lumbar puncture needles. Here we have the 22 gauge black needle which is likely to be sufficient for the vast majority of our neonatal population. It is one and a half inches long around this but we will show it out of the packaging in a moment. Depending on your location you may also have the 25 gauge blue needle which is a lot smaller. This is likely to be more beneficial for the extremely preterm neonate or for those in whom the 22 gauge needle was previously unsuccessful. We have chloroprep swabs or an alternative cleaning solution dependent on the baby's gestation and a premier pore dressing for the baby's back after the procedure. Finally, we have four sterile white topped containers we require four for the diagnosis of meningitis, but check if you need others. Two will be sent for microbiology, one for biochemistry and one for virology. Check your local policies and lab handbooks, because in certain trusts, a grey EDTA blood bottle must be used for CSF biochemistry rather than a white topped container. We will now open all the equipment. Here you can see it on top of our sterile field on top of the pre-sterilised procedural trolley. I have taken out two chloroprep swabs, one needle and my premier pore dressing. Because they are not sterile externally, I have sellotaped together my four white top sterile containers and these are kept separately. 
One of my helpers will then take off the lids during the procedure and catch our samples in each bottle. Here are the two needles. For comparison, the 22 gauge black needle and the 25 gauge blue needle, both quinky cutting type needles. The hold in a lumbar puncture is vital. The goal is to curve the spine to widen the spaces and create a greater gap for insertion of the needle. The most common mistake we see with inexperienced holders is that sometimes the neck is flexed and the hips flexed, but the spine itself is left straight, and this will not do for a successful LP. There are two different positions that we can use to achieve this spinal curvature. The first is the side lying position, with or without a wrap. This is the position that most of us will be more familiar with and have greater confidence with. However, the sitting position has been gaining increasing popularity and is now being used more commonly within the regional neonatal ICU. This has been following the publication of some positive randomised control trial results, such as the NeoClear study. This showed a better first chance success rate, as well as a reduced number of adverse incidences, such as bradycardias and desaturations. Study also tested a change in technique trialing earlier removal of the stylet from the needle. This, however, was not found to show a significant difference and therefore it is not something we have introduced to our practice. We will discuss both of these holes in turn through the rest of the video, but we will start with the side lying position with a wrap. To make a wrap for a side lying wrapped LP, you require a piece of fabric, approximately seat belt width. If your baby is bigger, you will require a longer length. To get the longer length, Fold a sheet on a diagonal. And we can see that we have increased the length of our, of our garment. And we take this to the baby. Place your seat belt across the, the cot with the baby a third of the way along. Place it across under the baby's scapula and then facilitate the baby into a side lying position. Side lying with a wrap enables hands to mouth. We then take the wrap across the shoulders and down under the femurs. We take them to the posterior aspect of the thighs and then we have the two wraps together. By pulling on these pieces, you're able to increase the posterior flexion and also the scapular protraction. So this wrapping enables flexion of the lumbar spine and hip flexion without, uh, in fact, affecting the alignment of the head. Hands are at midline and the baby is able to self-regulate. The helper is able just to pull on the fabrics to maintain the flex position. I can now start to prepare for the lumbar puncture. Before we start, I just want to say thank you to the Belfast Sick Children's Hospital SimMed team for donating us this lumbar puncture doll. I start by inserting my sterile field, just in case I accidentally make contact with the nappy or bed. The nappy stays on, just in case there's any accidents. I prepare my chloroprep swabs, or other appropriate cleaning solution. And I start by cleaning at the centre of the lumbar site, moving outwards in concentric circles to sterilise a wide area. Once I have cleaned peripherally, I never use the same swab to clean in the centre of my circle again, as it will be dirty. I clean down into the nappy area and up over the hips because we may end up having to feel there. However, because it takes time for the sterilising solution to dry, which is what causes the sterility, I do like to go ahead and feel my landmarks with two pieces of sterile gauze over each iliac crest, as will be shown now. When feeling the tops of each iliac crest, we can imagine an imaginary line between both tops, known as Touffier's line. In a neonate, this intersects with roughly the level of L4. We know in neonates that the conus medullaris ends at L3, and therefore our safe spaces are above and below the Touffier's line, 
L34 or L45. Both spaces are suitable and we tend to go for whichever one we feel the best. Here I am feeling with my thumb to identify both spaces. I try to leave a slight indent with my thumbnail to allow myself to know where to insert the needle and then I get my spinal needle ready. With the sheath removed we can identify the bevel. When I refer to the orientation of bevel up this is what I mean bevel to the sky. The reason this orientation is important is that when we look at the baby's back the meningeal fibres can be imagined running along the spinal cord. Inserting with bevel up to the sky creates a minimal cutting angle whereas when the bevel is inserted sideways this creates a much larger area of damage and much more damage to the meningeal fibres. This can cause CSF leak and a post lumbar puncture headache. Now with my bevel identified and my landmarks identified, I can go ahead and use my left hand to stabilise the baby's pelvis and body in case they jump and use my left thumb as a guide past which to insert the needle. Being careful not to give myself a needle stick injury, I insert with some confidence into my chosen space. The needle is straight but angled slightly towards the belly button or head and I insert with some confidence in case the baby jumps. This usually only needs to be inserted one to two centimeters in a neonate and to the depth of the pop as the textbooks describe it. When the stylet is removed you should see flashback and then we can go ahead and catch eight to ten drops in each container. However for the purposes of the video we have skipped past this. The stylet must be reinserted before removing the needle Otherwise you risk pulling out meningeal fibres and causing greater trauma and increasing the risk of CSF leak. When the full needle is removed we apply some pressure with gauze for up to a minute to reduce leak and bruising. And then we get our premier pore dressing and place it over the site. It's worth noting at this stage that if you had been unsuccessful in getting this first attempt you can try again at the other spinous space. For example, if you tried L34, you could try L45. Every subsequent attempt is likely to degrade the quality of your final sample due to bleeding and trauma to the tissues, and it is likely to further distress the baby, so repeated attempts are not advised. Now we will move on and look at the sitting lumbar puncture. To look at sitting LPs, the additional equipment required is two rolled tiles. One tile is going to go under the femurs of the baby and taking the, the pelvis into a more posterior incline. There we go. By having that hip flexion, we get a bigger interspinous space and a greater subarachnoid spinal space. To support the baby, we then give them tiles in front to drop onto. This tile will help the baby to self-regulate, hands are in midline, and they may choose to drop their head down and rest on it. You might be able to give them some sucros or, or any support of sucking that they may require. Your hands are held proximally at the shoulders, bringing them into a protracted position. And this then will be enable a lovely spinal curvature and a wider interspinal space. With the baby held in a lovely comfortable sitting position which they are tolerating well, I can proceed with the lumbar puncture. I bring my sterile trolley beside me and place my sterile field over the bed and under the baby in case I accidentally touch the bed or the nappy. The nappy is pulled down low but kept on just in case there is an accident as this can quite commonly happen during lumbar punctures. The next thing to do is sterilise our site, in this instance with some chloroprep swabs or an alternative cleaning solution for the extreme preterm. I begin with central concentric circles working outwards, cleaning a wide area. You're very careful never to clean the centre again once you have touched the peripheries as the swab is considered dirty. I do give the LA crests a little bit of a clean too, as I will be touching here to identify landmarks. 
While waiting for the cleaning solution to dry and become sterile, I go ahead and find these landmarks using two pieces of sterile gauze to protect my hands from touching the skin and maintain the sterility of my gloves. The tops of both iliac crests form an imaginary line that should intersect with L4. This is known as Touffier's line. At the midpoint I find the L4 body and I'm therefore able to identify the space above and space below L3-4 and L4-5. The conus mutillaris may come down as low as L3 in the neonate and therefore L3-4 and L4-5 are both considered safe. We would generally go for the one that we can feel the best. I make a slight indentation with my thumbnail. We now again need to consider our bevel orientation. In this instance, the meningeal fibres run from head to bottom and therefore the bevel up position will be more dramatic. A bevel laterally faced will be much less dramatic. This is the opposite of what we do in the side lying position, but it can be remembered as the bevel facing the hip in both positions. I reorientate my needle, ready to identify my landmarks one final time for needle insertion. I use my left hand to stabilise the baby's pelvis in case they jump and I use my left thumb to identify my spinous processes in space. I insert the needle alongside my thumb to use it as a guide being careful not to needle stick myself. I insert with some confidence until I feel a pop in a neonate usually between one to two centimetres. This pop, as the textbooks describe it, feels like a slight change in texture or a crunch almost like passing through sandpaper or thick cardboard. Upon removing the stylet, we notice flashback that confirms we are in position. We can now catch 8 to 10 drops in each sterile container, which we will not show here for the purposes of speed. If you did notice that the flow was very slow, you can consider rotating the bevel 90 degrees so that it faces towards the head. This may increase the flow and allow you to fill your balls. As before, please do ensure you reinsert the stylet into the needle before removing it. We place some pressure with a piece of gauze over the wound after removing the needle for up to a minute to avoid leak and bruising. We then get ready to place our premier pore dressing, which will keep the area nice and tidy. Don't forget as you finish up, to remove all pieces of gauze, sterile dressings, bin all of your sharps and then document your procedure. Try to leave the baby as you found them. We'll finish by having a look at our four bottles which can now be separated. Note that at the bottom here, the conical portion of the sterile containers is what you aim to fill. Difficult to see here with the angle of the camera, but as long as you fill this conical portion, that is usually sufficient and 8 drops is enough to do so. We can now ensure we send them to the right labs via the porters. Bottles 1 to 3 are usually sent for microbiology, for cell count to known S, bottle 2 to biochemistry, for CSF glucose and protein, and bottle 4 to virology. Thank you so much for watching this video, we hope you found it useful. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out our other videos. Thank you so much. Bye.